Well, I want you to imagine for a moment that today is a time and we lived in a world where Jesus has not yet come. Whereas the people of God, we still await the promised Savior. And enter John the Baptist. He came into our world and began to preach all of the things that he does in the Scriptures. How would you receive him? And before you answer that question in your own mind, let me remind you of the words describing what sort of character John was in Matthew chapter 3. In those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is he who was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah when he said, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. Now John wore a garment of camel's hair and a leather belt around his waist, and his food was locusts and wild honey. Would you have believed him? There's other places where Jesus says to those who are against John the Baptist, what did you expect? What did you go out in the wilderness to see? Someone in soft clothing and who's going to say nice things? You've got to go into the palace for that. So John is kind of a wild man, and he looks like a wild man. And for the established church of the people of God at the time, he sounded like a wild man. If you've seen The Chosen, their depiction of him is pretty good. He looks kind of crazy. And many people received him as such. Well, this question is really at the heart of our exchange today between the chief priests and the elders and Jesus in our gospel reading. Now, I have to say, I I should have included five more verses in the gospel reading at the end, because we can't really fully understand the exchange until we read those verses. So, I'm going to read those now. You can open in your pew Bibles to page 776 if you'd like to follow along This is going to be verses 28 through 32. So after he says, Neither will I tell you by what authority I do these things, the last verse in our bulletin, here's what he says. What do you think? A man had two sons, and he went to the first and said to him, Son, go and work in the vineyard today. And he answered, I will not. But afterward he changed his mind and went. And he went to the other son and said the same, and he answered, I go, sir, but did not go. Which of the two did the will of the father? They, meaning the the chief priests and the elders, said, the first. Jesus said to them, truly I say to you, the tax collectors and the prostitutes go into the kingdom of God before you. For John came to you in the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him. But the tax collectors and the prostitutes believed him. And even when you saw it, you did not afterward change your minds and believe him. So I pose the same question to you today. Would you have believed John the Baptist? We'll come back to that in a moment. But even when we make sense of the gospel reading's text for today, we're left with the question of what are we meant to take away from this exchange? Well, the first part of answering that question is to deal with the original question posed to Jesus about His authority. What or who gave you the authority to do these things? Now, the context of this question is really important. In the, in the chapter 23 prior to these verses, here's what's happened so far. Jesus had His triumphal entry into Jerusalem to Hosanna, behold, the King is coming, right? Glory to God in the highest. He's driven out, as I mentioned to the kids, the money changers in the temple. So He's come into the temple and He's flipped over tables and driven people out. And then He begins to heal the blind and the lame. All the while, the children, it tells us, are proclaiming his Messiahship, essentially. Hosanna to the Son of David. 
and then we enter in the chief priests and the elders, the ones who are supposed to really know what's going on here in the temple. And they ask Jesus, by what authority do you do these things? Who gave you this authority? That is the these things that they're referring to in the question. Well, Jesus has kind of a surprising and somewhat seemingly snarky response to them. He says, well, I have a question for you. And if you answer my question, then I will answer yours. And then he asks them another question about authority. John the Baptist's baptism, where did it come from? What's the source of its authority, in other words? Now, the Pharisees, we know from the text, they have an answer. They, we know what they think, that he's from man. But they're afraid of the crowds. They're too concerned with appearances. And they don't want to say from heaven because then Jesus will then say, why didn't you listen to him then? And so they go with a non-answer. We don't know. And then Jesus says, well, then I'm not going to answer your question either about where my authority comes from. Now, at first it may seem like he's saying that in spite, but really he asks the question about John the Baptist because the answer to that question is the same as the answer to the question that they initially ask him. Where does your authority come from? So wait, then for us, the reader, we didn't get an answer to the question either. Where does his authority come from? Well, we don't get the answer here in chapter 21, but we do in chapter 28, but we'll come back to that a little bit later. Now we must turn to the five verses I read to you a moment ago. These verses help us understand why Jesus chose to ask them a question about John the Baptist when they asked him about where his authority came from. We get a short parable about a father with two sons, and the father says to both of them, go work in the vineyard, and they each have a different response. The first one offends his father by saying, I will not, but then later changes his mind or repents and goes and works in the field. The second one verbally responds correctly to his father and says, yes, I will go, but then he also changes his mind and doesn't go. And then Jesus asks the Pharisees a simple question, or rather the chief priests and the elders, who did the will of his father? And they answer the first, the one who said no, but then still went. And then Jesus says, some rather pointed things to them. He says to them, Truly I say to you, the tax collectors and the prostitutes go into the kingdom of God before you. Now I want you to kind of imagine this scenario for a second. These aren't nobodies. You're in the temple. These are the chief priests and the elders. So imagine there's a whole gaggle of pastors up here, the elders of our congregation, and someone says that to them. That's what's going on here with Jesus. Turns out John the Baptist isn't the only wild man, at least from the perception of the established Jewish religious leadership. So why does he say this to them? Well, he says, for John came in the way of righteousness, but you did not believe him. Now, what does he mean by the way of righteousness? What does that even mean? Well, it means that John the Baptist is acting within the gracious action of God that has now begun in Jesus. He's the first part of God's action in the world that leads to Christ in this New Testament. That's why he begins the New Testament as witness to Christ as the preparer of his way, to prepare and till up the hearts of God's people to receive and believe what Jesus has to bring 
to do and to say. And how is the way of righteousness, not only with John the Baptist, but with Jesus to be received? By believing the messenger and by extension, the one who sent him. And guess who did that? The tax collectors and the prostitutes and the Gentiles and the sinners, but not the chief priests and the elders. Jesus tells them, but the tax collectors and prostitutes believed him. And even when you saw it, that saw that they believed him, you did not afterward change your minds or repent and believe him. Now we see why Jesus' answer to their first question was a question about John the Baptist, for he was the beginning of the revelation of the same authority which drives the ministry of Jesus, the will of the one who sent him. John's task was to prepare the way for Jesus, and Jesus is the salvation of the world. Their authority comes from the same place. God the Father in heaven. So it turns out that the chief priests and the elders, they're not like either of the children in the parable. They're neither son. They didn't say, yes, we will go, and then didn't go. And they didn't say no and decide to go. In fact, what Jesus is saying is that they're not repentant. Despite what they have seen, and heard, they have not changed their minds and believed the one sent by God. So they didn't say yes to the Father, and at least not yet, they haven't gone to work in the vineyard. And so they get these stinging words from Jesus. Well, now that I've explained all that, you might still be wondering, what the heck does that have to do with me? Well, there are a couple of takeaways for us this morning. One is that there is a call in this to examine ourselves. That's why I started the sermon by asking you the question, would you have believed John? Jesus is warning those like the chief priests and the elders, those who have heard the Word of God so often and so frequently that it no longer does what it's supposed to do for them, which is to daily kill them and make them alive. I know this is a danger for me, to become so familiar with the amazing and radical things our God does because, well, I come and hear it every week. I read about it often and I just sort of gloss over things that are world-changing, quite literally, as if they're normal. One of the reasons that C.S. Lewis is one of my favorite authors is because I found that when I read him, he wrote about the common and normal things that I was used to hearing, but in ways that I had not heard and reminded me of those truths. That's one of the reasons that maybe you also like to read books from people who became Christians as adults. I often wonder that they come into churches and they look around and are like, you don't, don't you understand how big of a deal this is? Because we've just gotten so used to hearing it. You've probably heard the phrase, familiarity breeds contempt. This is what Jesus is speaking against. And so I ask you today, does God's Word still kill you and make you alive each day? Does it still call you to account and cut to the heart? If not, maybe you should examine yourself. I urge you to do this. Pray for wisdom and insight into God's Word, and then examine yourself according to it. Is your response to God's Word that you believe Him and repent in faith? The second application of today is one of comfort. You see, the nature of our Lord Jesus Christ is that there's always time for repentance and belief. See, Jesus does have authority to answer the question asked. In fact, He has every bit of it there is. All of it belongs to Him. He says in Matthew 28, verse 18, And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. 
As I shared with the kids, that's not comforting by itself. Especially if we take seriously the fact that we have made ourselves enemies of God. That means then, if we put it in terms of authority, we made ourselves enemies of the one who has all authority in the universe. Don't know about you, but that's not a very comforting thought to me. In fact, I'm starting to wonder what the heck we were thinking. And yet, right after verse 18, Jesus answers the question that His statement prompts, because as soon as He says it, we're thinking, well, what exactly is He going to do with all that authority? turns out that He delights in calling unlikely people to Himself, just like those unlikely people came to the message that John the Baptist preached. Unlikely and unworthy people being brought to faith, a gracious, gift-giving faith from God Himself. It turns out that that's what Jesus has chosen to do with all the authority of heaven and earth. He's chosen to save you, to forgive you, to redeem you, to make you His own for eternity. And in case you're doubting whether or not you're worthy, Jesus reminds the chief priests and the elders here the sorts of people that He calls to Himself, tax collectors, prostitutes, sinners, Gentiles, all those unworthy of God's love receive it in Jesus. So, dear friends in Christ, maybe you need to do some repenting today in regards to your faith life. Don't be afraid. There's always time to do so until our Lord returns, for He is long-suffering and patient and merciful, and He delights in calling you to Himself, for that's what He's chosen to use all the authority that's been given to Him for to pour out of Himself completely in death on the cross and risen from the dead, all things have been given into His hand, including you. So may this text today cause you to examine yourself, but also be a comfort to you. For indeed, Jesus has authority, and He's chosen to use it for you. In the name of Jesus, amen.